Hello besties and welcome to a sunny book nook. Today I am going to be doing my long-awaited review of The Midnight Lie, a full political analysis and annotation <laughs> and commentary on this book and what I got from it and the takeaways that I thought the author was attempting to say as well as just my own personal analysis. So stay tuned but you know before we do that like comment subscribe all that stupid bullshit and follow me on my Instagram and Twitter if you want and friend me on Goodreads. So yeah, anyways. Okay, so here I have the book with my annotation in my notes. So I think I'm gonna break this book down by the three main points that I broke it down by with my three different colors sticky notes. I think that the first point of this book is its world building and the structure of the world which is obviously a reflection and analogous to systems of oppression within our real world and in this world we live in the ward and the ward is um, a blocked off walled off circle area that half kith are allowed to live in. They are not allowed to leave. Half kith are people who are on the lowest class, middling are the middle class, and high kith are the upper crust of society. And they just get to party all day and live a magical, wonderful life with luxuries. However, the middling have more autonomy and say than the half kith, but they are still limited in their ability to wear certain things, hear certain things, say certain things, eat certain things, and the half kith are the most um, repressed on that end. They can't wear certain hairstyles, can't eat certain foods, can't um, say things, can't leave the ward, and the ward is walled off. So basically our main character, Niram, is a good girl and she fits a lot of classic young adult fantasy tropes of being an orphan, of being traumatized, having a lot of childhood trauma, and also um, not really being someone who is intentionally trying to like lead a rebellion or something. She's not a rebellious girl, she's just trying to keep her head down and get through her life. And the thing is, is that she works for a middling woman who chooses to live in the ward. Her name is Raven. Raven is almost like a mother figure to Niram, and Niram is very much aching for a mother figure in her life because she thinks that her mother abandoned her, which is why she left. She was left in the baby box in front of the orphan. So basically, Niram was taken in under Raven's wing, haha, <laughs> get it, when she was 12, and now she is an apprentice at Raven's bakery. The bakery is run by Raven, Niram, and two other girls who are also orphans or other people that Raven has kind of taken in. But Niram and Raven are using the bakery as a front for their real hustle, which is making fake passports to assist half kith into crossing the ward wall and getting into better living conditions in the middling quarters. The reason why Niram is essential to this task is because Niram has a really strong gift and that's the other element of her character that is very typical of the YA main character fantasy trope. She has the gift of very very strong memory. Like she remembers being a baby and being placed in the baby box. She can remember and copy things meticulously and incredibly accurately, which is why she works for Raven in forging passports and documents and legal documents to assist our half kith who are trying to escape the ward. So that is the world building and a little bit of the character information. In this world also, we need to talk about the state and the culture and the policing system that exists. So there are militiamen who guard the ward and walk around the ward making sure no one is disobeying their half kith assigned rules. And also if you do, um, even if you don't, you can just be dragged out of the street in broad daylight or in the middle of the night and never be seen again. But what is known to most half kith is that if you are caught violating a law, like you're wearing a coat you shouldn't be wearing, you're um, eating something you shouldn't be eating, or if even a soldier smells that 
you have been eating feels like your breath is too sugary or whatever or your hair is too wavy that's not allowed then you can be thrown into prison when you're in prison you have to give up a tithe tithing is the system of punishment in this world where basically half kith are subjugated by the militiamen into giving them a pint of their blood or a limb or their hair or teeth something like that and half kith don't really know what they do with that but that is their punishment also another element of this world is that people do not seem to know or remember the history of the place or how it came to be or any sort of cultural understanding of like why these are the rules who was in charge and how they are in charge no one seems to remember everyone just says it is as it is when niram asks you know what would what would I do? What would you do if you were not born half kith and you were born high kith? And people are like, why would you even think that? It is what it is. You're a half kith. They're high kith. You will never know what their life is like. They will never know what your life is like. That's just how it is. So because of this culture of secrecy and no one actually quite knowing what what the history of the world is combined with the brutal repression by the state through the militia and the prison system we can see that this world closely resembles the superstructure and base theory of marxist analysis which i will put a picture of it here basically it's the idea that the base meaning the means of production the capitalists the workers people who do labor sell their labor and then the people who control the labor and labor distribution and product distribution as well as the entities that uphold the state such as the police and the prison forces and the military and the actual government entities all make up the base and that then feeds into and is also a result of the culture and that is within the superstructure so the superstructure and the base are in a conversation with each other we call that dialectics in marxism and within the superstructure we can see there are elements of religion and culture and family and food and music and media and books and we can see through the world in the midnight lie that the repression of media and the, the rules um, obligating low kith, half kith into positions of inferiority on every level on a cultural way is also a result and also feeds into their economic exploitation because Niram as our main character she reflects on her memories of her time at the orphanage and how she was forced to do work as a young child because that's how all the orphans lived because they just creating things for high kith luxuries there's a really tragic scene where niram is describing how as a child she would be making tortoise shells by literally killing live tortoises so that these tortoise shells could be used for the decoration of the high kith obviously in this world the isolation between the worker and the product of their labor is also very evident here because most people who are the laborers and the actual creators of the food and the decorations and the magic that the high kith get to experience never actually see the product of their labor themselves and are completely removed and separated from it they're not allowed to consume it they're not allowed to read even though they're the ones printing the books they're not allowed to wear pretty things even though they're the ones making the pretty things stuff like that right and because of the setup and how culture influences the um, economic structure of a society and how the superstructure and the base have a dialectical relationship we can see how niram as an unassuming young girl along with her com entire community who are all just essentially trying to get by she only awakens to class consciousness when a new character arrives on the scene niram gets thrown into prison when the first within the first few chapters of the book and in prison she meets a sly flirty character named sid and sid brings up a couple questions that actually i think begin to trigger niram's questioning of the world around her so on page 90 in chapter 17 of the book that's towards the beginning this book has a lot of chapters by the way niram is talking to the other girl that works at the bakery shop with her and her name is mora so niram asks mora why does a lord protector rule harith harith is the name of the city by the way what do you mean why how did that come to be she looked at me strangely 
we have always had a Lord Protector, but not the same one. Of course not. When one dies, he is replaced by the council. The council is the political ruling class. They're all high kith people. Yes, you know this, Niram. You're worrying me. What happened to you in prison? This is after Niram was in prison. She comes back to the bakery. I thought of Sid's questions, her frustration with it is as it is. I'm just thinking, there must have been a first Lord Protector. How was he chosen? And why Protector? To protect us against what? The rest of the world? Confusion crossed Mora's face. There's only Harith. There's the ward and the city and the island and the sea. That is not true. There are other countries across the sea. There have been wars. War. Mora said this word as if she didn't understand it. There is no war. There has never been a war. You're making my head hurt. So basically, when she's in prison, Sid asks a bunch of questions because Sid is a traveler from other countries, from another country. Sid has come and Sid is like, I heard that there's magic here. What the heck is up with that? And Niram is like, um, I don't know about all that. And then Sid is like, okay, so how does this world work? Like, why are you not allowed to wear this? Like, why were you thrown in jail? What are, was going on? And Niram is like, I can't, that's a good question. I could not tell you. <laughs> Niram is literally like, she's being faced with this. And another element of this, the second point of the big three points I wanted to talk about, the first one being the economic and political, sociopolitical structure of the world. The second point is the romance in this book, or rather the romances, romances. Here in this book, we get a really solid breakdown of compulsory heterosexuality and how patriarchy operates within a patriarchal society. In this world, Niram is in sort of a fake relationship with this guy named Aiden. Aiden is a print shop worker dude, and Aiden and her work together to make the passports for Raven. He is also in on the scheming, and Aiden is kind of into Niram, but Niram is not really into him at all, and it's really clear in every scene that they interact with. Aiden is always the one trying to initiate, and she's always the one being like, this is fine, I guess. But when Niram meets Sid in the prison, she initially thinks that Sid is a boy because Sid is always talking about how many girls she sleeps with and how many women she beds and all the like wild things and adventures she's been on. But Niram, because it's a prison, it's very dark inside the prison walls, like Niram can't fully see what Sid looks like and Sid has short hair and everything. So she just immediately assumes that this is some playboy dude who has come from overseas and is just playing around and traveling. But then when they leave the prison, Sid gets revealed to be a girl who has boobs and Niram notices those boobs. <laughs> There's a really funny scene when they leave where Niram is like, oh, I realize what I did not notice when I was in prison. She has breasts. It's, it's very funny. And there is a lot of banter and attraction and teasing that goes on within their relationship. And eventually through the course of this book, Sid takes Niram in as a lady. Um, so Sid goes undercover as a high kith, um, makes her own little passport, fakes her own identity to live in the high kith quarters and see how they live. And once she lives in the high kith quarters, she uncovers a lot of very interesting things about Harith and this country. But what I was initially bringing up with the second point about the romance and the heteronormativity and how like lesbianism and the love that develops throughout the story is really important because we see Niram as she navigates choosing to trust Aiden or Sid um, and not knowing who to trust because obviously she's known Aiden for so long and she doesn't think that he will betray her at all. But that is not always true and she hasn't known Sid for this long but Sid seems to care really deeply for her and is pointing out a lot of things in her life that Neuron previously didn't know to even question and that brings me to the third point of this book the third theme that I think is really important to the entire structure of the story and that is Neuron's relationship with Raven. Raven is someone who Neuron views as a mother figure as I said before and because of that Neuron's perception of her is very skewed. Even in the first scene that we are introduced to Raven, she is shown being 
very cruel to Niram for no other reason other than supposed discipline for being a 12 year old child. She basically makes Niram put her hand underneath a chair and then Raven sits on top of the chair in order to put the weight of her and her body in the chair on top of Niram and Niram is not allowed to make a sound. It's honestly horrifying like that is genuinely like physical abuse especially considering raven has such such power over niram as like her guardian and basically throughout this entire book we see raven manipulate and confuse and emotionally tangle and physically abuse and verbally abuse niram but niram is completely unassuming to Ra raven's behaviors and raven's toxic behaviors because she thinks that that's what motherhood is supposed to be like but the thing is is that when sid comes in her life sid realizes this is not okay and the relationship that raven has to you is fundamentally transactional because raven is ultimately just using you for your skills as a forger your skills as someone who has a very good memory not you as a person she doesn't actually care about you the same way that sid also points out to niram that you know aiden doesn't actually care about you and we can see that through sid being quite jealous every time she witnesses niram and aiden together and how niram since we're in her point of view from her perspective she's dealing with a lot of tumultuous feelings inside her because she feels a deep level of attraction to sid and she doesn't feel anything really for aiden and she's just really bad battling it out because she doesn't think that this is like natural or okay and there's a really good scene where on page 94 in Niram's head the internal dialogue that she has is it wasn't allowed for a woman to love a woman at least not in the ward it was a shameful thing I couldn't even guess the tithe the council encouraged half kith to marry babies are a blessing we were told larger homes were allocating for growing families special council funded rations were awarded for births I wasn't sure what a woman did with a woman in bed, but I knew that it didn't make children. So here we can see how heterosexism and reproductive autonomy and patriarchy interacts with how the capitalist class wants more laborers for their production system and a greater populace in order to exploit, which is why the council encourages the half kith to marry and why being gay is ultimately uh, the greatest sin against capitalism um, in that the idea that you can't um, reproduce and create more of a labor force, more of a labor market. So here, that is another example of how I think all of these things are tied together in the real world as well as in this fantasy universe. We see how the modes of production and the economic systems at play, as well as the social systems at play and the social hierarchies of gender and sexuality and also class interactions also interact with these abusive and manipulative and toxic various relationships our main character has with different people in her life. All of these things blend together into a story that is incredibly compelling and is really good at dropping little details into the beginning of the story and throughout the entirety of the story up until the final reveal and the different twists and reveals that we get throughout the entirety of the book. So, so far I haven't given you any spoilers. I've given you a lot of details about the book and I've got given you sort of a breakdown of the world and like my thoughts, my general thoughts on them. But I think from here on out, it's gonna be spoilers. If you haven't read this book already, go read this book. And here are my spoilery thoughts. <laughs> I feel that there are three major turning points in this story in terms of reveals. The first reveal of the betrayal of Aiden onto Niram. There's the scene where Niram goes up to Aiden and she's like, I'm, I come here to tell you something. It's on page 198. He's basically like, God, Niram, you're acting like I'm forcing you. It'd be nice, you know, if for once it was you who wanted me. I imagine lifting my mouth to Sid's. Heat rushed to my cheeks. You're so pretty when you blush. I understand if you feel shy sometimes. I know that girls do. There are men who take advantage, but I never will. But you are, I wanted to say. You are using what you know to keep me in place right by your side. You don't even know you're doing it. And I am too afraid to say what you're doing because of what you might do to me. 
that's one element of the reveals that is important, I think, for Niram to have for herself. Niram realizes that Aiden is actually taking advantage of her by holding his knowledge of her activities and the illegal things that she's done over her head. And when he eventually finds out that she is in love with Sid and they've been fucking, he is goes ballistic and basically drops a bomb on her by being like, Raven doesn't even actually love you. And Niram's like, no, Raven loves me so much. What are you talking about? And that leads me to the second reveal that's really important in this story. When Niram finally realizes that Raven is taking advantage of her, the scene where she approaches Raven is honestly so tragic. Even on page 264, like when we're this far into the book, Sid asks, is your forging connected at all to Raven? She was entirely too anxious for about losing you for a month because you know uh, Sid was about Sid was going to take Niram in as her handmaiden uh, <laughs> for a month in the High Kith ward. There was all that talk about her project you were working on. Was this it? I thought she was just being manipulative. That she was making excuses to control you and keep you by your side. She isn't manipulative. She was worried about how many people would have to wait for a passport because I was leaving the tavern. You're right. We work together to give forged passports to people who need them. She has a good heart. She has helped so many people. Aiden has too. So even then, Niram has still not come to the realization even that far into the book that these people are scamming her and taking advantage of her to the highest level. Aiden only wants her for the potential sexual romantic attraction that he feels he's entitled to. Raven only wants her because she feels that she's entitled to the labor of this orphan girl because, oh, I took you in, you should be so grateful. But the thing is, is that Raven is the one who is profiting from the exploitation of our main character because Raven actually has a second house in the middling quarter with a servant and she has kept it secret from Niram. But everyone else in the ward knows, even the other girls that Niram lives with under Raven's roof. And that scene where that reveal is given, where Niram knocks on the door of Raven's house in the middling quarter that she didn't even know existed. And Raven comes out and Raven is like, what the fuck are you doing here? And first Raven tries to pivot into a, oh my goodness, like I wanted you the whole time. I wanted you to be to be as my true daughter and live in this beautiful house with me. We could, we could live such a beautiful life. And Niram is like, no, 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 wait a minute. Have you been charging our customers an exorbitant amount of money in order to give them their passports when this whole time Niram hasn't even been paid for her work. So basically, Raven has been exploiting Niram, extorting the entire ward because everyone who wants to get a passport has to go to her and they have to pay a huge sum of money. Niram never knew that Raven would get that, Raven got that money. Raven never shared that money with anyone else. She just put it away to have another house in the middling quarter that Raven didn't tell anyone about, that well, didn't tell Niram about, but everyone else in the war just like knew about it. Isn't that just so disgusting? And then when Niram eventually finds out about it and approaches um, and confronts Raven about it, Raven completely backtracks. And eventually Niram is like, in that one scene, Niram's like, listen, listen here, fucko. I am not dealing with this bullshit anymore. You are evil and twisted and I've been helping these people get passports for out of the goodness of my own heart. And I genuinely thought that you and Aiden and all these other people are genuinely good people because I want to help you. And that's the only reason why she's done anything in this entire book. It's just so sad seeing the innocence and the ignorance of Niram in contrast to the cunning manipulation of so many systems and individuals around her. So that's the second reveal that was really heartbreaking and plot moving. Like that is what kicks off the actual fucking craziness of the story. And the third big reveal is when Niram realizes that the magic elixir that she's been drinking while hanging out in the High Kith ward is actually the diluted blood of half Kith people. When Niram realizes that the magic that makes the High Kith ward so beautiful and so wonderful, that allows people to float on the ceiling and to make houses grown out of trees and to have, be able to drink vials of dream, uh, of nightmares, or to be able to have dresses that have 
fairy wings on them or be able to, you know, all these cool, crazy, magical things, they're only possible due to the harvesting of half kith bodies, the literal taking of their blood through tithing, the literal taking of their hair through tithing. It's a common high kith practice to literally wear the hair of half kith people. And I think that this is a direct reflection and analogy of how rich people wear poverty and the aesthetics of poverty and also the aesthetics of oppressed people like it's a costume, like it's a fun thing to do. When Niram first enters the High Kith ward, she's afraid that her half kith dress and the muted earth tones and the weird cut of it all was going to make her stand out and not have her pass as high kith but what actually happens is that sid is like don't worry about it they're just gonna think you're dressing up like a half kith and it's just a little costume for the day and niram is like why the hell would these rich ass motherfuckers the literal high kith of society want to look like us when they look down on us so much and that's the question. Why is there so much cultural appropriation when there's also so much anti-blackness in society? Why is there such a massive double standard for people who like are rich and day drink versus people who are poor and day drink? Why are the cultural attributes of the lower classes within society once um, adopted by the upper class of society, they're suddenly, it's like a fun little costume. And I think that that was a scene that I was like, wow, this is, this is very interesting. This is saying a lot of things right now, I think. It's also important, I think, that Niram realizes that what the elixir she's been drinking that makes everything cool and nice and lets her float on the ceiling is actually the blood of a half kith people and also the floor that she's walking on the glass mosaics the glass tile on the floor is stuff that she knows the person who made this glass and she never imagined that this colored this beautiful colored glass was going to be walked upon she knows the people who made this bread and and made these books and like when she enters the high kith ward as an infiltrated low kith person she realizes that the product of her labor and her community's labor is ultimately going to the frivolity and absolute excess that these high kith people are allowed to luxuriate in day in and day out when she and her peers work incredibly hard every day to just survive only for the products of their labor to be a party decoration and nothing more I think that that is a really good reflection of the way that working class people and working class lives and the labor that we and they do end up becoming something that is ultimately just a banal object in our day to day lives when the reality is, is that many f university furniture is made from prison labor and a lot of our clothing is made from exploited labor of women in the global south and our technology is made by metals that have been mined unethically and you know like there are just so many different ways that we as consumers are removed from the labor that we do as workers and the labor that other people do as workers and i think that this book encompasses uh, the realization of um, that, that actual, that literal class consciousness in a very interesting way. The conversation that Sid and Niram have on page 20, 214 is there's an observation of the Agora. And also the Agora is probably the first, fourth point. I said three, but there's actually probably four, four points about this, four reveals that are really important. The Agora makes up the fourth one. But anyway, this conversation goes, Instead of stones, the agora was paved with translucent glass tiles arranged in patterns of colors. I know who made these, I said, an artisan in the ward. I've seen them heaped in baskets in her glass blowing workshop, but I never guessed that they would be made to walk upon. It's so impractical. Don't people slip and fall? No one here moves very quickly, Sid said. They take really delicate se steps. And then Sid is, there's a little flirting banter. And then Sid is like, I always want to know what you're thinking. What do you think of this? My heart felt hot and hard with resentment. I think that it must have cost a fortune. I think it's not fair that the high kith should have so much beauty when we get so little. Sounds revolutionary of you, Niram. The tiles made in the ward are pretty, but ordinary. They don't glow. I think someone is purchasing things cheaply from the ward and improving them somehow. 
And that leads me to the fourth point, which is the Agora. Throughout the entirety of the story, we get little snippets of Niram realizing things in her ward. For example, she chips away at some of the white paint on the walls and she realizes that there's color underneath there. Sometimes she realizes that her presence makes people remember things and she asks the bookshop keeper, do you remember if there is a history of this city of Harith in your books? And he's like, oh, I've never had a history book on my shelves ever before. And the rich people don't, Highkith never want it and the middlings don't want it either so I don't know I've just never made it and then she's like no but think think and she like holds his hand and she's like think do you have a history book on this city and he's like he kind of goes into a glaze and he's like wait I do I remember that this book was written here about our first lord protector about Harith and my ancestor did this so like there are little moments like that where then she sneaks back into the Highkith and she is also able to manipulate some of the memories and perceptions of the people around her. For example, she sneaks into the council building by telling the guards, I was not never here. You're letting me in because I am someone who is meant to be here and no one came here during this time. She walks in and the guards literally don't even, this, she's just a blip in their memory. So she's she realizes that she has powers in this way and she realizes through this that Everyone is being cast almost under a spell of an ignorance. There's a veil of ignorance about the city. No one really knows why half kith, high kith, middling is how it is. No one knows the origin of Harith. No one knows who the Lord Protector actually is. No one knows why they celebrate the, the seasons that they do or why they celebrate the holidays that they do. And she'll be at like towards the very end of the book, she's at a celebration and people are getting thrown items. And she realizes that all of these items are all tithes taken from half kith people. And then she realizes, what is this holiday even for? Who knows? And so then she turns to someone next to her and she asks, and like they're like, I have no fucking clue because no one knows. But then she's like, no, you have to remember. And she like grabs their hand and they're like, oh, it's because it's a celebration of like the, the first Lord Protector being ruled. And she's like, fuck. So then at the very end of the book, when she realizes, dude, there's something really crazy going on in the city. She then goes into the council and runs inside and is trying to find the book that talks about the origin of the city. When she finds the book of the origin of the city, she realizes that this is related to a dream that she's been having since the beginning of the book. And I think that this is what is so brilliant about the book is that it's like a book within a book at the very end where she's reading the origin story of Harith and she's like, whoa, so these gods were fighting each other, but I saw this god in my dream. And then the actual Lord Protector comes in. They have a little banter, they talk a little, and he's like, okay, I will trade, if you give me your heart willingly, then uh, I will give you the entire history of this city. Everyone will become awake and will remember the history of this city. And she's like, okay, she does it, and once everyone becomes awake and understands the fact that, you know, this city is the way it, that it is because of some powerful gods manipulating people into caste systems and exploitative positions while harvesting the magic of these half gods while making them the lowest class within society, she basically becomes a god as well. She loses her heart and in the epilogue, the very last line of this book is, Someone comes up to her and says, Niram, who do you think you are? I say it loud enough for all to hear. I am a god, I tell them, and I am your queen. And that's how the book ends. I'm like, that's fucking crazy. And it also is such a good example of the way that a lot of revolutionary stories and stories about revolution, stories about the uncovering of the truth and lifting the veil of ignorance among the masses of people and the awakening of class consciousness among one person who then leads a rebellion unintentionally or intentionally, is that at the end, liberation does not always come in a form that is predictable or accessible or in any way comprehensible, honestly, because at the end, this ends up being all like a little co-optation. She goes up to the guy who's been creating the system of oppression for years and he's like, oh, I'm bored of this shit. I wanna go back to the gods and hang out with the gods instead. You can take my role instead. So she is then 
as someone who was like deeply oppressed by the system is now at the forefront of the system. And I think this book is a standalone. And I think that ending the book on that note is so crazy and so true and so real. <laughs> because the thing is, is that ultimately when a single person is who you rely on for the idea of building a better society, um, and it's entirely based on an individual and not like a community and understanding that and deconstructing the society that they live in it's more of just like one magical thing that happens all at once of course like the replaced system for the political socioeconomic system that was in place before the next one in charge is not necessarily going to be the greatest uh, although we don't actually know what it's like yet but the fact that she then takes that position of i am your queen i am your god and takes that like monarchical uh, mo monarchical based rule on this city now is very interesting and i think it raises a lot of questions about what political awareness and consciousness ultimately means for even unassuming trusting people like Niram and how she literally loses her heart in the process of trying to make a better world for the people around her and her community. So that's my in-depth review of The Midnight Lie with my notes helping me along. And you know, I had a lot of annotations and I tried to film this video yesterday by literally like reading all of my annotations and I got through maybe the first one fourth of the book and it already had been like an hour of me trying to explain my thoughts. So today I just kind of try to break it down a bit more thematically, less quotes and details and supporting details to prove the points I'm trying to make. However, I still think that hopefully I've made good enough points and that make enough sense and that this political analysis video was helpful for you or was insightful for you in any way, this review. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know if you're excited for another edition of um, a political review situation or if I should stop doing this series on my channel <laughs> because this was a lot of work and I loved it, but if people are not going to want to see any more, then what's the point of doing it, you know? Because uh, it's a lot of work for me. It took me like two weeks to do this whole annotation thing and rereading thing. Anyway, those are all my thoughts. Let me know down in the comments below if you agree with me, if you disagree with me, if any of the takeaways that you had from this book, if you've read it, is um, and in any way similar. And if you haven't read this book, let me know if this review made you want to read it even more, even if you watch all the spoilers. Sometimes I do that before I read a book. Again, thanks so much for watching. Like, comment, subscribe. All that super bullshit again. And mwah, bye besties. <laughs> See you in my next video.